So the the first paper is uh, our MAR prize winning paper. Uh, the title is uh, Relative Attributes. Um, is authored by David Perrick at the TTI Chicago and uh, Christine Grauman at UT Austin. Uh, David will present the paper. Please. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Devi Parikh, and this is joint work with Kristen Grauman. Um, so let's say we teach a computer what a horse looks like by giving it several example images of horses. Then we also teach it what a donkey looks like um, by giving it example images of donkeys. Um, practical considerations aside, even intellectually, it seems very unsatisfying if I now have to teach it what a mule is by giving it more example images. It seems like once the machine already knows donkeys and horses, I should be able to teach it about mules just by describing them as being furry, um, having four legs that are, longer than, that are shorter than horses, as having a tail, but that's longer than a donkey's tail. Attributes let us do exactly this. They are mid-level concepts that are shared across categories, and because they're visual concepts, they can be detected by machines, and because they're human interpretable, humans can use them to describe things. There are many works, in the, especially in the past few years, that have looked at attributes for various problems. But most of these works think of attributes as categorical and, in fact, binary. For some attributes, like having four legs, this is perfectly fine. They are inherently binary attributes. But for some other things, like the tail being longer than a donkey's tail, binary attributes just don't work. It's inherently a relative concept. And these relative descriptions are very natural for how humans communicate. And this isn't true just for describing mules. Um, this is also true, for example, in image search. Let's say you're looking for an image of downtown Chicago, and this is what you get. Maybe what you were looking for was more or less like this, but you didn't want so many people in the picture. Then the way you would think of the image you want is that it's a similar image, but less congested. And that, again, is a relative description. Let's look at another scenario. Let's say you unfortunately got mugged in, let's say, Rio. Um, you, go, you go to the cops, and you describe to them the person who you think mugged you. And they may show you this mugshot as a plausible suspect. Perhaps the person who mugged you maybe looked something like this, but was smiling more. That, again, is a relative description. So relative descriptions are clearly very natural to how humans communicate. But one might wonder if the point here is relative or whether what's necessary is just a set of absolute scores, just going from discrete entities to absolute continuous numbers, and maybe that's good enough. Let's look at an example. If I show you this picture and ask you, is this person smiling? Most of us on a scale of one through four would agree that no, it's probably a one. And perhaps the same thing with this person. It doesn't look like he's smiling much. On the other hand, if I ask you, is she smiling? Then most of us would agree that yeah, it should be on, a, on about four, on a scale of one through four. But what about this person? On a scale of one through four, how much would you say she's smiling? Is it a 2? Is it a 1? A 2.3? Square root of 2? Not only are we likely to be inconsistent on this estimate, generating a number for what's a semantic concept is just not something that comes naturally to humans. But on the other hand, if I asked you, is she smiling more or less than this person? We would all very easily agree that she's smiling less than this person. This shows that what we're talking about is not just from going from binary concepts to continuous numbers. What we're talking about is relative attributes versus absolute attributes. And that's the main idea of this work. The great thing about relative attributes is that they enhance the mode of communication between humans and machines. With relative attributes, you can relate objects to other objects via attributes, and that's a much richer semantic class of relationships that we can talk about. They're more informative while still being natural for humans. So in this paper, we propose the notion of relative attributes. They can be used for relating images and categories to each other. We model the relative attributes via ranking functions. And then we use these attributes for two novel applications. The first is zero-shot learning from attribute comparisons. And the second is automatically generating image descriptions in terms of these relative attributes. So how do we learn these relative attributes? For any attribute that we want to learn, let's say open, we are given two modes of supervision. The first is a set O of ordered pairs of images i and j that says image i is more open than image j. 
And the second is a set S of unordered pairs of images I and J that says image I is as open as image J. We wish to learn a scoring function that is a linear transformation of the image features. We would want this function to satisfy the following constraints. For pairs I and J that belong to O, we would want the score of image I to be greater than the score of image J. And for pairs of images that belong to S, we would want the score of image I to be equal to the score of image J. We learned this function via max margin formulation based on the work of Joachim et al. And pictorially, this is what it looks like. Let's say this is the feature space that we're working in, and these are the images along with their desired rankings. This would be the weight vector that we learned. And note that projecting these points onto this weight vector preserves the desired ranking. The margin in this case is, dis is defined between the two closest images in terms of their ranks. With this in place, given a novel image and its image features, we can predict the value of the relative attributes for that image. So how do we use these relative attributes for zero-shot learning? By zero-shot learning, we have the following setting. During training, we are given images from S scene categories. And we are given only descriptions of U unseen categories. We don't have any images for these unseen categories and only descriptions. What do I mean by descriptions? Let's say the machine understands the relative concept of age and how much a person is smiling. Then we would describe the unseen category Clive as being younger than U, but older than Scarlet. Note that we have images for U and Scarlet, but not for Clive. And similarly, the unseen category Miley as de is described as being younger than Jared, and also more smiling than him. Note that to describe the unseen categories, we need not use every single attribute in the vocabulary, and we need not relate it to every single scene category. This allows for a lot of flexibility in the supervision. At test time, an image is to be classified into any one of the S scene or U unseen categories. So how do we use this information? We have images from the blue categories and only descriptions of the green categories. How do we build our category models? What we will do is we will use a generative approach and build the category models in the predicted relative attribute space. Since we have images, we will as assume that each category is modeled as a Gaussian distribution. Since we have images from the scene categories, we can predict the, attribute, the values of the parameters in the Gaussian quite easily. But what do we do with the unseen categories? Let's look at it one at a time. For the category Clive, we know that he's younger than Hugh, but older than Scarlett. So we will assume that his average age is the average of Scarlett and Hugh, which falls somewhere here. We don't have any information about how much he smiles, though. So we'll just assume that he smiles as much as celebrities on average tend to smile, which would be somewhere here. And that gives us the distribution for Clive. Now let's look at Miley. We know that she's younger than Jared, but this is a one-sided constraint, and so we don't know how far left she should be from Jared. So we will assume that she's as far to the left as Jared as consecutively aged celebrities tend to be from each other. That would be here. And the same thing for smiling, which gives us the Miley distribution. With this, we have distributions for all the scene categories and for the unseen categories, and given a test image, it can be assigned to the category that gives it the maximum likelihood. With this, what we've managed to do is to teach a machine novel concepts simply by relating them to concepts that it already understands in terms of these attributes. Let's look at the next application, gen automatically generating descriptions of images. Let's say this is the image that we wish to describe in terms of the concept of density. A traditional binary description would simply call this image not dense. And at best, it might give you an example of what it means by dense and not dense. But we can clearly do better than this. If density has been learned relatively, we can sort all the images in the data set based on the predicted density value. And if this is the value for the novel image in terms of its density, we look at a pre-selected number of images to its left and to its right. And we use these images as reference image to describe this image as being more dense than this image, but less dense than this one. This is much more informative than just the binary description, not dense. We can also analyze the categories to which each one of the images belong and describe the novel image in terms of the categories that we have, that it is more dense than highways, but less dense than forests. The details of how we do this are in the paper. 
We consider two data sets to evaluate our approaches. The first is the outdoor scene recognition data set of Oliver et al. that has eight classes, and we consider six attributes such as natural, open, and so on. The other is a subset of the PubFig data set that also has eight categories, and we consider 11 attributes such as smiling, chubby, and so on. To train our relative attributes, we've been provided the supervision at the category level. For example, coast is more open than forest. We propagate this information to the image level and use that to train our ranking functions. We consider the following baseline approaches. For zero-shot learning, the first baseline is just using binary attributes and using the direct attribute prediction model of Lampert et al. The way this works is straightforward. Each category is described as a binary signature of which attributes are present in the category and which ones are not. Given a test image, we compute the probability of each attribute being present in that image, and it's simply assigned to the category that has the most similar signature. The second baseline we consider is training relative attributes via classifier scores as opposed to ranking functions. Pictorially, what this does is if these are the images in the feature space, and this again was the desired ranking, Instead of training a ranking function, we simply, we simply separate these points as positive and negative based on whether their rank was high or low, and we train a binary classifier. The corresponding weight vector would be this, and projecting these points on that weight vector would lie here. Note that these, this projection does not respect the ordering of ranking that we wanted, as seen in the swap of the orders between these two points. This will affect the quality of the results we get in the end. For automatic image description, we compare the relative descriptions to the descriptions that you get by using binary attributes. For zero-shot learning, we evaluate a few different aspects. The first is the robustness of our approach. In particular, we look at how the accuracy varies as we use fewer and fewer comparisons to train the relative attributes in the first place. And the second is looking at how the accuracy varies as there are more and more unseen categories, which means there are fewer and fewer seen categories. The second aspect we look at is how much flexibility our approach allows for in terms of the supervision. For example, how loose can the definition of the unseen categories be in terms of how you select the reference seen categories to describe them? And what happens if you use fewer and fewer attributes to describe the unseen categories? I will only show you results for this last one, and the remaining results can be found in our paper or poster. So these are what the results look like on the two data sets. As there are fewer and fewer attributes being used from left to right, the performance of the binary attributes degrades significantly because each attribute is only a binary entity, and if there are few attributes, there are only so many classes it can classify. But our approach, on the other hand, has a significantly higher performance, and more importantly, it degrades much more gracefully. If you compare the use of our ranker that you see in green to just using a classifier score as a ranker, or as the value of the relative attribute, you see that that also degrades gracefully, but the overall performance is, use, is lower than using the ranking function. This shows the importance of thinking of these attributes as ranking functions as opposed to just continuous outputs of binary classifiers. This tells you that using an attribute relatively is much more discriminative. And if you think about it, this makes sense, because even with a single attribute, if you use it relatively, theoretically, you can carve out a feature space up to arbitrary precision. Let's look at a few examples of the image descriptions that our method generates. For this image, the binary description would simply describe it as not natural, not open, and has perspective. But if you look at the relative description, that's much more informative. It's more natural than inside city, but less natural than highway. It's more open than street, but less open than coast, and so on. Interestingly, this other image happens to have the exact same binary description as the previous image, whereas the relative description is in fact different. We can also describe people relative to other people. And if you think about it, if you were to try and describe a celebrity whose name you forgot or don't know, you're more likely to describe the celebrity relative to other celebrities that you know. To evaluate um, how much more informative the relative description is compared to the binary description, we conducted some human studies. What we did was the following. We selected a secret image, and then we automatically generated a description of this image using either the binary attributes or the relative attributes. We then throw in a couple of distractor images in addition to the secret image and present all this information to a subject. 
The task of the subject is to look at the description and identify which one of the images was likely to be the secret image that generated this description in the first place. For example, if I tell you that the secret image is smiling and young, and maybe I also give you examples of what I mean by smiling and what I mean by young, then could this have been the image that I was describing? Seems like it, she's smiling and she's certainly young. Could it be this one? That also seems to fit the binary description. This one, well, he's smiling, but perhaps is not all that young. So that's unlikely to be the secret image that was being described. So the binary description is unable to disambiguate between the first two images. But if you now look at the relative description, I tell you that the secret image is more smiling than this one, but less smiling than this one. Then that already tells you that the first image is not likely to be the secret image because she seems to be a little too happy. In our experiment, in our studies, we always show equal attributes for relative and binary, but as you saw here, we didn't really need the second attribute to figure out that this image is likely to be the secret image that was being described. These are what our results look like. We conducted these studies for 18 subjects, and we used 30 different test cases. And what we found was that with relative descriptions, people are more likely to identify the secret image in their very first guess. In summary, we proposed the notion of relative attributes, which we learn as ranking functions. They, they allow for natural and accurate zero-shot learning, where we can teach the machine novel concepts simply by relating them to concepts that it already understands. They also allow for precise image description that humans can interpret well. The most important thing, however, is that they enhance the human-machine communication, which has several applications in image search, providing classifier feedback, and so on. The data from our paper is available online. Thank you.